I know where I stand with the Navy. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. And, and another military veteran. All yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, she was uh, 21 years in the Navy. And um, we have a lot of fun. We joss each other all the time. And uh, so won't you stand up, Karen? This is your show, Sergeant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping I could shift it, you know. <laughs> nice try. Yeah. Well, I would like to... Uh, what I re well, what I really need to do is run you through the uh, when we were putting on our way to go overseas, and it was kind of interesting. I'll be I'll be quick about it. I don't get into too much detail, but I will on the breach landing. And uh, we left at the uh, Broadway Pier there in San Diego, and we still didn't have any idea where we were going. We thought it was going to be uh, Petaluma Island or uh, or Yap Island, either one of those two. We, th we thought that's where we were going to land. But we heard different when we left California and headed for Hawaii. And we parked about a mile and a half out in on the other side of Hawaii, right in front of the Pearl Harbor area is where we were at. They would not let us go ashore. Uh, the whole thing was that um, they uh, didn't tell us where we were going until we were about halfway to, the, uh, to uh, Hawaii. And we were all called on deck, all Marines on deck. I got up there, and here they had a huge flag of uh, Iwo Jima on the, on the uh, rigging. So then we knew where we were going. And we were asking each other, where are where, where's Iwo Jima? Never heard of it. Just so you guys know, too, he doesn't follow the PowerPoint per se. It's just additional. Do what? <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to uh, hit and miss a little bit as to uh, how things came together. And uh, all in all, uh, when they uh, described uh, Iwo Jima to us on, that, on the rigging, it was, a, it was a huge flag up there, chart I should say, and uh, explained to us. Well, the, the thing of it is we came in on um, the... Uh, first wave, but what I'd like to say something also about the, we stopped at uh, the Wittetok Marshall Islands. That was our first stop when we left San Diego. And real quick here, the thing that I was fascinated with, we were, as you guys probably all know, that the Marshall Islands are in enemy of waters, you could say, Japanese waters. And I was on the railing there looking at the Wittetok, that's where we were anchored, and here comes a submarine down through the middle there. Boy, if that wasn't, that was really encouraging to see something like that, because we were worrying about uh, suicide subs coming in there, and that's what we were kind of concerned about. So these subs circled around um, among our convoy. I think we had three troop ships, if not four, out there around uh, the Marshall Islands. Early the next morning, I couldn't believe the Navy task force that was anchored all the way around the Marshall Islands. There was just, uh, I think there were, what, three carriers, I believe, on the whole island. And then, uh, and battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and I think there was the New York, the uh, Tennessee, Texas, well, the, uh, I think that's about the only one. There could be four. And um, these were the, the battleships that were going in with us. And the, 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 the coverage that they gave us was, uh, I don't know how to put it, but uh, it was just uh, the Navy and the Marines were together. That's what we, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Is, um, and the Navy made sure that uh, the troop ships were guarded because we had no way of protecting ourselves on those troop ships. And so we had to, do, we had to uh, depend on the Navy to, to give us, uh, to guard us in. Well, okay, getting to the, uh, uh, I kind of wanted to let you know how things went from California to, to uh, Iowa there. Um, okay, we were in LSTs. We changed from our troop ship to uh, LSTs in the Saipan area. And then we, early during the night, we took off for Iwo Jima. And uh, I... I crawled on top of an ammunition truck, 
And uh, I wanted to get my first look of Iwo Jima. Two of the Marines were walking by and he says, what are you doing up there? And I says, well, I want to get my first look on Iwo Jima. Okay, we'll join you. So there were, there were three of us on top of this ammunition truck. Early that mo the next morning on the 19th, we, we woke up by a huge exploding fire from the terror guns. And uh, Iwo, this Mount Terabati looked like a Christmas tree. I couldn't believe how that mountain was being peppered. And, I, and we were thinking, well, maybe we can take Iwo Jima in three days. Because there's just no way we thought that any Japanese could survive. Well, it was, we were proven different. And uh, so we went on in, circled up around Mount Suribachi. And I think this is what you want to hear, isn't it, part of the, the landing? Yeah. Huh? Okay. And um, so we were, uh, I would say, about uh, 1,200 yards to 1,500 yards out in the ocean. Um, the LST were lined up there facing Iwo Jima, and uh, the, you could, the Japanese artillery, for some reason or other, we were, we were beyond that. When they, the, the, uh, that is, that is as far as they got with that artillery fire. And um, so everything, everything started right in here. The Tennessee battleship was parked right in here. And I want to say maybe 300 yards from the shore to the Tennessee. And I'll tell you what happened in that area. And uh, the Tennessee was backed up over here. And this is where I came in, right here. I was on Red Beach 1. Uh, the 28th Regiment was on uh, Green Beach. And then we were together with Red Beach 1. And we went in together. And um, the area between here and uh, uh, the Tennessee battleship, I'll describe to you what took place. It was just a bloody bath between that area. It was just uh, unbelievable. We lost three M trucks before we got in. And when I got in, I came through here, I got on the beach, and then I got hit. Well, in this area here, we were, uh, in, uh, we were supposed to take Sarabachi and someone, in, I think at least a day or something like that. No way could that happen. No way. It was just, uh, Mount Sarabachi was nothing but an artillery area. That mountain was heavily armed. And all the artillery up in the other end of the island was zeroed in on Mount Sarabachi. The Japanese knew where we were going to be, they knew where we had to try to find coverage. And they were in caves all the way through this whole island. I don't know how many caves I threw grenades into, but that was the only way we could secure them. We had to close them off. And uh, that was one thing that uh, was hard to do. And uh, um, when I landed in here, I was at the foot of Mount Sarabachi, or at uh, Modem Airfield Number One, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sure most of you guys have uh, heard of uh, John Bassalone. Have you, any of you heard of John Bassalone? I guess not. <laughs> have you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he was Guadalcanal. So anyway, he was in our outfit, and um, we were between uh, Mauna Yoma Airfield and, the, and Suribachi. We were supposed to take Iwo Jima, like I say, three days. But we were in this area here a good week and a half. I was on top of Mount Suribachi for four days. I was there for the flag raising. And what we were, we were the sniper hunters. We took care of all the snipers to give the flag raisers protection. That's what our job was. And uh, the area between Suribachi and Modi Elmi Airfield number one was nothing but a bloodbath, starting out here in the water. And what I, what I say is the blood actually started out here in the water. It was not on the land. The killing, let's put it that way, the killing started out in the water. We had, when I was going in, I looked at the, at the other end of the, 
of the uh, Tennessee battleship, and there was an Nimchak coming around the bow. It got hit. This can, there was nothing left. Then the next M track was right next to me, which is probably about from here to the length of this room. And that was knocked completely out of the water. And I'm going to put it this way. I saw a leg flying up in the air like this. Part of the hip was still attached. This had to be one of my buddy's legs. And I watched it come down, splash into the water. Well, then the next instant, a Navy dive bomber was coming in along here. And we had Marine Corps Corsair fighter planes diving into the mountain, giving everything that was geared around the troops to give us support. And the Navy was doing a, you know, a beautiful job. And that Navy dive bomber was coming through here. He was machine gunning the beach. He was froze to the trigger. The wing guns were still firing. And he was down, he was coming down about three o'clock. And we thought he was going to crash right into us. And I had my leg over the side, and that's as far as I got. And he was over me, just where the ceiling's at. I looked up, and the pilot's head was hanging out of the canopy. The gunner behind him was still alive. And he crashed to my left, right into another M track. So that had to be the third M track. So the M track that went down on my right, I fig we figured the next shell is ours. And, and so I'm not stretching it, but I was on the outside of our, of our M track. And the shell landed right in here. I had my arm up here like this. In fact, the shell could be just six inches my way. It would have been right on top of my head. It was just that fast. And so we got in, and we were in this particular area. We were the, like I say, they were on the M-Track of that area. And then what I like about the M-Track is it can open up at the rear. I like that. The Higgins boats opened up at the front. And as you guys well know, so I really like that M track. So we spun around, and uh, the ramp, the, the gate went down, and I ran out. I probably got from here to that wall, and then I got hit in the hip, and it knocked me down. And at the same time, I was looking at uh, towards the Modium Airfield airstrip at the, at the end of the airstrip, and uh, I got. Uh, Checked myself out. There wasn't any blood on my pant leg or anything like that. But I had a, it, oh, I had a, I had a hell of a bruise. But I could move around. And there was a marine that was uh, rolling around on the ground at the foot of this airstrip, and his whole backside was smoking. And uh, I thought I got to get over there. I got to help him. So I made it. I got over there to him, and I dropped down on my knees beside him, and there was a Japanese to my left. I had about that much area to kneel down next to him. I grabbed a hold of him because he was rolling back and forth trying to get the pack off. And because he was, he, he was just, the whole backside was just ripped apart. And uh, I finally got a hold of him and took my uh, K-bar, cut the straps and took the pack off. And his whole back, the hide and everything came off with the pack and his uh, dungaree jacket that he's had on. And uh, about that time, I was trying to scrape the phosphorus off with my fingers, which was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that because I burnt my fingers. So I grabbed my K-bar again, and I started flicking that stuff off of his back. And a coroner come running up. He says, OK, Jack, I got him. And his name was Dolan. Tell, talk about a dedicated corpsman. He was wounded five times. Now that's dedication. And he took care of that Marine. I jumped up, turned around, jumped over the body of this dead uh, Japanese. And I don't know why I looked down, um, but I did. His tennis shoe was one piece, and the big toes out here like this. And I thought I was for climbing a tree. Well, I was proven wrong. 
a little bit later on. And uh, I kept running. I rejoined my company. And then as I was running across the airstrip to get back to my company, uh, I had bullets flying around my feet. I thought for sure I'm going to go down any minute. Those bullets were just flying all around me. I, could, I still to this day can't believe I didn't get hit. But I kept moving along and uh, jumped down alongside the uh, airstrip. There was a guy that was yelling, I need help. And uh, so I ran over there to him and uh, jumped down beside him. And he says, OK, you take this point, and I'll take the, other, <coughs> the end of the airstrip. <coughs> take that point, excuse me. <coughs> and um, one second. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Hey, I'm trying to catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the show. Well, <clears throat> well, I did a little skipping here and there, but uh, details. So, but if you want me to slow down the holler. Keep on going, Jack. Good. You're great, buddy. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, this whole thing there around the... ODM airfield number one. Uh, I'm going to say one thing, then I'll get back to what I was going to talk about. That um, we were supposed to take you on three days. I think you guys know that. And uh, we spent a good week or more around that area. There was just no way that we were going to get through this, all this uh, Japanese artillery fire. So anyway, um, so I jumped off over this Japanese and I ran to back gut to my company. Well, then we moved on up and um, we ran into a bunker. And that bunker was so well hidden, we didn't even notice it until we were right in the middle. And boy, did they nail us. And uh, I, uh, well, we, there was a slot about like that about four feet, and another one four feet, and another four, all around this bunker. And uh, so we, I, I crawled up there with the rest of the guys, and we started throwing grenades into this uh, rifle port area there. And uh, after a little bit, I made a comment. I said, I'm going to go around, see if there's a way into this bunker so I can check it out. And uh, so I went around. And I found an opening over on the back side. It was about this wide and it slanted. And the walls of that bunker were at least this thick. So as I was easing my way in, I looked around the corner. <coughs> Here were five Japanese laying along the wall, foot to head, foot to head, foot to head, foot to head, foot to head. They had the rifle up under their chin the big toe stuck in the trigger. And that's the way they blew their head off. Their brains were all over their buddies behind them. The whole thing uh, is that uh, the Japanese were to stay on that island, do or die. They could not go back home. That was, that was their, there was, there was not a troop ship, hospital ship, or anything, any aircraft or anything to keep those Japanese supplied. They fought with what they had. And uh, I call that nothing but bravery. I mean, those guys are strong, and they were ready to go for their country. And uh, it was one of the things that uh, I have to, have to admire, because they were dedicated just like we were. They loved their country just like we loved our country. So. <clears throat> Getting back to those uh, five uh, Japanese that were along the wall, uh, <coughs> I ran out. I says, bunker secured, move out. So we moved out, and uh, there were bunkers and pillboxes. Uh, <coughs> yeah, let's see here. We don't have the uh, symbols on her, do we, Karen? 
Well, anyway, the it's item. Right behind it. Huh? Right behind it. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay, here we go. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. So all these black symbols you see, there's nothing but mili um, pill boxes, bunkers, and whatever, machine gun nests, and so on. And how in the world we were to get through all that is unbelievable. And uh, we spent a good week right in this area, right in here. We had a hell of a fight going on, and uh, all night long. And we had a front line, and he, we had to retreat at least 100 yards back towards Suribachi. It was just that rugged. The Japanese were really nailing us. They had all their artillery fire coming in this direction to cover Mount Suribachi and to, and to take us out. That was the, idea, the whole, that was the whole idea. And uh, these uh, <coughs> markings that you see here was the, <coughs> the first a plan <coughs> to uh, <coughs> land on Iwo Jima. And so that was passed up because there was a lot of coral in this area. Well, we still hit coral over here because our m track hit some coral. We went up and down like this. So I'm beginning to wonder, are we ever going to get in, you know? But um, just the, the whole battle here in this whole area here, it lasted a good week or more. This is unbelievable. And uh, I was on Mount Suribachi for about, I would say, a good four or five days, sniper hunting. And that group picture that you see of a group of Marines up there, or where is it? Uh, oh, yeah, on my, oh, yeah, on that. Yeah, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, <coughs> we were all snipers, hunters, is what our job was. And we guarded the, uh, the flag raisers. And um, so what happened there, I'd like to kind of talk about that just a little bit on Mount Suribachi. Um, the, what was taking place was, well, let me make a couple of com comments here first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got a report, you know. <laughs> What was going on was that, um, let me get back to the Amtrak landings. And uh, that's where uh, I ended up on Mount Suribachi. I was about 10, 15, 20 feet below where the flag went up. And uh, so the 28th Regiment and the 27th Regiment went together on that area, on that flag raising area. and. Uh, Ira Hayes and I were real close buddies, and he found me, you know, and so we, we were together when we went up on that mountain of Father to Father. And um, this, this was on the 23rd, so that gives you an idea. We landed the 19th of February, and on the 23rd, it was five days later, we were still in this area. It's unbelievable. It just, just gives you an idea how rugged it was just in this area. And we still had the rest of the island to take. And um, so we, Ira and I went up the mountain and uh, on the 23rd, and he says, looks like those guys could use some help up there. It was windy. The wind was really blowing up there. And on the bottom of that picture, you'll see uh, timber tree trunks and so on from the Pacific storms that blew the trees up there on top of that mountain. Gives you an idea how rugged that uh, those storms are there in the South Pacific. And so those guys are really struggling trying to get that flag up. Ira says, I think I'll go up and help him. I says, go for it. I'll cover you. And he took off. And uh, this, uh, uh, I didn't see Ira for well, just a few hours later, uh, when uh, we um, were finally able to, well, we had to, 
we did we did take the area. We had we had there were snipers everywhere as far as that goes. You know, they just uh, coming from out of the ground, and uh, it was it was difficult to get uh, kind of in control because he would nail you. It didn't make any difference where you were at. They could pick you off, and um, so I had a bullet hit me right up here. I could feel that one, and uh, so I was lucky there, and. Uh, so just to narrate just a little bit on the flag raising, um, and I want to jump, can I jump ahead on that, Karen? You already. I like the way, huh? If I click on that screen, see all the different slides, and go to where he's talking about, I'm using his computer. I don't need to jump. I don't need to jump ahead, Karen. No, you go right ahead and do your thing. The Navy's used to this. <laughs> <laughs> you guys see what I put up with? <laughs> wow. No, I love her. Okay. You're good. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Um. Yeah. Okay. I'm still down in this area here. Um. I heard a a um, another marine yelling for some help, and I looked over. And uh, I had to run across the airstrip, like I was mentioning. I had a, I ran across that airstrip twice, back and forth. And I still didn't get hit. I couldn't believe it. But uh, I, th I think I told you about. Oh no, I didn't. Uh, what it was? When I got over there to him, uh, I took over, like I mentioned. Well, what I want to say is that I saw three B-29s coming in. Two B-29s are just skinning over the top of the water, just barely making it. The one in the front, he was up a little bit. He had two engines that were still running. The other two engines were dead. But those other two air, air B-29s were just missing the water. And, I'm, and they finally crashed into the water. And the crew come jumping out of that plane, running down the wing, and jumping into the water, and I thought, boy, I hope you guys could make it, because we're, we're still a little ways out there in that water. And uh, those two B-29s sank just like there was nothing to it, you know, you know and uh, because of the, the gun turns and all that sort of thing. The water just comes right in and sunks that, you know. So <clears throat> um, that B-29 really hit the end of the airstrip and it bounced, skidded into a bomb hole. By the way, the B-29s did a lot of bombing there on Iwo Jima when they were flying over to uh, Japan, and uh, which was the big help to us. Uh, so we had the help from the Air Force, and uh, the, I, I don't know how many of you know why we had to take Iwo Jima, do you know why? And if you know why we had to take Iwo Jima? Okay. Huh? It was a spot where the B-29s could go down and, and, and the people could be rescued. Right? Well, yeah, the thing of it is, okay, I'll take it from there. Uh, the B-29s were flying over. They were, they were having to go up in elevation when they got to Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was the shortest route to Japan. And uh, so they would have to go up in elevations to get above the anti-aircraft. And then they would come down and coast into Japan. And then they would go back up in elevation again. So what I'm driving at is that they spent a, a lot of fuel doing this because they had a heavy load of bombs in the first place. So then when they would drop their bombs in Japan area, turn around and come back, 
they would run out of gas, fuel, and they would crash land in the water. And uh, we were told about this uh, when we were still on board ship. And we had a determination, we're going to take Iwo Jima. The crew that were left behind, the, BP, the PBYs, would load up as many of the crew as possible and fly into Hawaiian Islands and then come back and try to pick up the rest of the crew, which was in the morning. Well, there was nobody around. The PBYs picked up as many as they could do, but they had to leave some of the, of the crew behind. And those flyers were not found. It was figured that they were eaten up by sharks or just drowned in the, in the cold wall because it was February and it was cold in that area at that time. And uh, the, this, when we heard what was happening to the B-29 Flyers crew, we, we made up our mind, we were, we're going to take that island. And um, so that's why we had to take Iwo Jima, so that they could, and, that, and I, oh, I saw those three B-29s fly over when we were at the end of that airstrip. I saw them flying over, heading towards Japan. And then later on, here they come back, Two of them crashed down in the water, like I mentioned to you, and the other one hit the, on, the, on, the, on the island. And <clears throat> um, what was uh, interesting was when I took over, I had a crossfire like that in the land strips, and I was landing right in here. And uh, the uh, a B-29 crash land right, right straight, I would say it was right straight out in front of me. Couldn't be any more than 100 feet. His vehicle, and the bullets that were hitting that B-20 was un uh, be unbelievable. And uh, I saw the crew jump out and they just scattered all over. And I went like this to indicate I've got cover over here, I have coverage. One of the crewmen was running towards me and he jumped down beside me <coughs> and he slapped me on the back and he says, damn, am I glad to see you. And I says, I'm glad to see you too, sir, but get your butt out of here because I'm moving out. He was a major. <laughs> and he asked us, where's your headquarters? And I told him, in that direction. You head for it. When you get to the beach, then go to your right to, and go towards the Mount Suribachi, and you, you'll find all our, some of our headquarters in that area. He didn't even say goodbye. He just took off. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, that's why... Um, but that particular area we were having trouble with uh, landings. And uh, the, there was no way that the B-29s could land on, on those airstrips because they were pretty badly torn up. And, uh, so anyway, getting back to um, the uh, rest of the island, and we hit that, uh, those bunkers. Uh, by the way, I'd like to mention here that uh, Japan calls uh, Iwo Jima tomb. Iwo Jima Tomb is what it's called today by the Japanese. And uh, like I say, Hirohito or Tojo made the, the order that you are to sac sacrifice your life right there on Iza. You can't come home. And uh, I, on Mount Saribasi, I crawled into a cave. And uh, there, all my buddies are calling me crazy, you know, you're crazy, Thurman, going in there. <laughs> but I wanted to go in. I wanted to see if there was something I could find of value. And uh, so what I did, I'm about five foot nine, so, and the hole's about this big around, <clears throat> and there were some spots in there where I got stuck. And I had to back out a little bit and then squeeze my way in through, and I got through a couple times. See, the Japanese are pretty small. and. Um, but I didn't have my pack on or anything like that. So anyway, I was crawling along that cave and I counted the length of my body as I moved down that cave. And I got up to about 18 feet in that cave. And I stopped <clears throat> and I noticed a box up on my right hand side. And uh, so I carefully checked it out for any kind of booby traps and it seemed to be clear. So I just gently pulled it down put it in front of me, and uh, I started to crawl backwards. Boy, did I, have a trouble, did I have trouble trying to dig my way back, going with my toes, knees, and elbows, trying to back out of that cave. 
What was so great though, when I finally got down there where I could see some light uh, on the other end of that cave, I yelled, I said, I'm coming out. And uh, when I got to the end of that cave, my buddies grabbed me by my feet and pulled me the rest of the way out of that cave. I thought that was pretty nice. I, I, I felt, I, I'll never forget that moment. So anyway, anyway, one of the guys uh, opened up the box and here it was, a map of all the, like you see it right here. Yeah, that's just what I, that's what I pulled out of that cave. And then uh, the, one of the uh, uh, NCOs, he says, okay, I'll t take this down to headquarters, close the cave off. Well, after he left, I says, well, sir, to the other officer that was there, I says, I would like to go back in. Maybe there's something that I missed. So I went back in. And I got down to the end of that cave again. Along the wall, there were three lamps along the wall. And the, the ceiling jumped up about this high. And uh, I think they were oil lamps, is what they were. And uh, so I, uh, <laughs> I caught him looking at his watch. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, I got down to the end of the cave. And I looked at the other end where it turned into the mountain. I thought, do I want to go down there and see what's around that corner? I wanted to see what was around that corner. And about the time that I was deciding to take a look around that corner, a Japanese came around the corner of that cave. He had his arm up like this. I had my rifle on him. I come so close to killing him. And I'm thankful today that I didn't. He was just a young Japanese, but it just that the whole moment only lasted a few seconds, and he jumped back into the mountain. So today I'm glad I didn't didn't kill him, and I'd like to tell you a little story about uh, when uh, we were up at uh, Modi Elmi Airfield Number Two. I'm kind of skipping around here. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where can I pick you up at? Uh, I, <laughs> I actually made a new PowerPoint last night and it didn't save, so I apologize. I'll get it to you. It's all right. We're I had some neat pictures. Good, right? Huh? Go ahead, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I like that thumb. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. We, we have a lot of fun together. And, she wins most of the time, makes me mad, you know. <laughs> um, so, okay, you know, you know, these are, there's little things that, um, you know, you have to think about. Um, I didn't uh, write the full story in my book. I just felt that um, I didn't need to get too deep with it. And, uh, and what I mean by that is that, uh, uh, I didn't want to be pinned down by people making remarks at me. Oh, you, you, you love the Japanese, huh? So I didn't want to hear that kind of crap, you know? So I didn't uh, really complete the whole story. But uh, now I'll tell it to small groups, and uh, hopefully you guys will take it right. So what happened was, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, well, my commander said, I need volunteers. We're running out of ammunition. And I jumped up and I says, I'll go, sir. And my buddy to my right, he says, I'll go with Jack. So the two of us took off. And like I say, this was around 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I knew where the ammunition was in the bomb hole along the beach there is where it was at. And uh, so... What happened was that uh, we ran down into the bomb hole, grabbed some ammunition. We all, both was, I had my rifle over my back, and then we both had ammunition in each hand. And I looked, I, I, okay, I'm going to say something here. You can feel oh, when a bullet is close to your face. You can feel the concussion, the air, and also shrapnel, piece of, the piece of shrapnel goes fly. You can feel it. Okay, I felt this bullet going by and hit my buddy to my right. 
who was about, about uh, maybe eight feet from me. And I saw him go down. He was dead before he hit the ground. And I thought, I got to get over there and help him. And uh, so I did. I got up, ran over there, and all the while, okay, now this is where I didn't uh, put it in my book because I didn't want to get ripped by it. But it's important. I'll put it this way. There is respect on the front line. There is respect. And I learned it. And so when I ran over there, my back was turned to that sniper. I was ready for him to shoot me in the back any second, but he didn't, didn't shoot. And I figured it out a little bit later that he was awed over the idea of what I was doing for my buddy that he had just killed. And I got over there to him, pulled his face around. He was hit right up here. And of course, this side here was pretty well destroyed. And uh, I took his box of ammunition and uh, I t t t carried it back to where I was at. And I still had to circle around. Well, what I want to bring out here is this Japanese sniper knew what my job was. And my job was to take care of snipers, as many snipers as you could get. That island was just full of it. And um, if you don't mind, I'll tell you the, what happened. And um, so when I was taking care of my buddy, I was sitting, I was on my knees there, and I was thinking, damn, I got to run out in the area here, open area, to get to that sniper. I'll bet you anything, till this day, that sniper knew that I had to get him. That was my job. He knew it. And I am sure. He says, okay, I'm tired of killing. I'm here. Come and get me. So I circled around, got behind his sniper's nest, and uh, um, I uh, got, can I, I was, my pack was full of ammunition, dynamite and stuff, and TNT. And I made the bundle about like that, and I jammed it in there behind him. And when I blew that thing up, there was three Japanese under that palm tree, two palm trees, and they were false. I couldn't believe it. And uh, there were two Japanese that were already dead. They were, their, their skin was yellow and dried and stink. Oh man, did they stink. And I can't, could never understand how this sniper stayed in there with those, with those two guys. If that's, by that smell. The machine gun that he was using on my buddy, the barrel's at least that long. And was called the bamboo machine gun. And it was air cooled. And uh, so I went a little further on in front of where this sniper's nest was at to, to check things out to make sure I got everything covered. And um, well, the blast uh, blew this sniper in half. And uh, his uh, heart was hanging out of his rib cage, and it was still beating. And uh, his hips and knee legs were about 10 feet away. So, you know, I, uh, I'll have, I had a little bad feeling there. He was no doubt a father, a husband, brother, or something, just like the rest of us. So I am glad to this day that the favor was, was returned in that cave there on Mount Surabashi. And so this is why I say there's respect on the front line. He could have killed me, easy, but he didn't do it. Did you just want to say something? Oh, you rifted your page. <laughs> so anyway, I kind of wanted to bring this up because uh, I think we all know that, that when we're in battle, there is respect on the front line. And, uh, that's what that Japanese was doing. He was showing me respect, and yet I had to take him on. Because if I didn't, I was the only one that knew where that sniper was at. And this was around 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning. So I knew there was a sniper here. So I just couldn't let it go. 
because he would kill more Marines, because that was his job, to kill more Marines. So I had to take him out. That was my job. And it's, it's not a happy thing to have to do either, I'll put it that way, but it has to be done. And um, so uh, I, I grabbed his ammunition. I had uh, two boxes on each, under each, each arm, my rifles over my back, and boy, I had a load, but I got, I got back to camp. And uh, which was um, ODM Airfield number three. So I hope you didn't mind my telling that story. Um, just to give you an idea of what uh, really goes on out there in the battlefield. There is respect by the two enemies that are facing each other. They're being gentlemen, you can put it that way, but you still got, you got a job to do. And, uh, so that, that, uh, these are little things that uh, I don't know. I've never heard of it before, but uh, I, was the middle of, I was in the middle of it, you know. And uh, so, see, we were butt up in this area here is where we were at when all that took place. And, uh, um, you know, what I can do, if you like, I got more to talk about here. Um, if you like, uh, I can take questions, if you like. Yeah. Did you see the uh, first flag? That yes. Yeah. And yeah. The one? I saw the second one also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you what, fellas. When that second flag went up, we were P I S S S E D. Oh, <laughs> uh, we were really irate over that whole thing, and uh, <coughs> the. The, the original flag was only up for five hours, from the 19th of February to the 23rd of February. But that first flag, what, the reason that we were so dedicated to that first flag was that first flag saw the first Marines killed out there in the water and on the land. And that's why today, that first flag, that's my flag. You have it? Huh? Who has the flag? Is it uh, uh, I had an honor flight back to uh, D.C. and then they uh, uh, drove us to uh, Quantico, Virginia uh, to the museum there. And the flag is up on the wall above the entryway into this, uh, entryway into this auditorium area. And so the flag is up on that wall. <coughs> and what makes me mad, there's nothing there indicating that we was on the Jima. Nothing. Just the flag was up there, and that's all there is to it. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm, I'm bothered with that. But uh, the reason that we had such uh, uh, dedication to that first flag, like I say, is that first flag is all the first Marines killed on Iwo Jima. That's just the way I feel about it. And today, I still feel the same way. And, uh, so I'm glad that came out. I, I passed it up. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Your responsibilities was taking out snipers. Did you use the M1 or did you use the... I had an M1. I had an M1. Uh, when I went in the cave, um, I asked one of my buddies if I could take his car beam because that M1 was too big to drive to drag down in that cave. Because like I say, the cave was only built like that. And I, I crawled, you know, a good 18 feet. And I had a hard time doing that. But uh, I had a carbine in the cave, and then the rest of the time on the island with my M1. And then, I'm going to go back. If you want to kick my butt, Karen, you can. <laughs> There's so much that goes on, really. We were pinned down by a pillbox. And um, I just happened to think of this. Uh, we, were, we were pinned down by a pillbox. And um, there were, we were, had quite a battle going on. And uh, the guy to my right was killed. And he had a, a flamethrower. And uh, I thought to myself, 
See, I was in the Carlton Raiders for eight months. When I went into boot training in San Diego, I went right into the Carlton Raiders. And uh, uh, I really got some good training, strong, solid training. And we, uh, we, our, our uh, destination was uh, submarines. And I've never been on a submarine before in my life, but boy, in the Carlton Raiders, I know all about the, the, the submarines today. And uh, so we would dive. <laughs> the reason that the, the skull up here is that uh, we land at midnight. That's the whole thing. We land at midnight. And, uh, and the stars in the sky. So this is, what we were, this is the way we were trained. And uh, also we were trained how to uh, plant a mine on the hull of an enemy ship or whatever, you know train how to do that and uh, at that time uh, we, like I said we didn't have uh, earplugs there on when we were landing uh, but uh, we had a snorkel that we had to learn how to use that snorkel which was sticks above the water and you just swim under the water so that you can't be detected and that's the way you can creep up on an enemy ship and things like that so anyway I got some real strong training with the Carlson Raiders. And um, so, so what to, the thing that took place uh, that uh, really helped me a lot was uh, I hated to do it, but damn it, there, there's things you've got to do. And uh, there's just no questions about it. And on this pillbox, I don't know how many hours we were pinned down by this pillbox. And uh, I saw my buddy killed, and I thought, well, I'm going to put that flamethrower on because I know how to use it. And so I put it on, and I start creeping into towards the appeal box. Two Japanese come running out, just yelling and screaming. And uh, everybody that was there, I'm sure, hit him with, a, their, with their bullets, and then I, I put him away. With the, with the flamethrower. And that is the most disgusting thing you ever want to witness. And when I was through, I took that flamethrower off and I threw it on the ground. You know what I did? I shot the trigger off. I didn't want anybody. It was just terrible to hear the Japanese screaming and hollering with all that napalm. And he was trying to wipe it off, you know. So it made me sick, you know, to see that. So I'm glad today that, as far as I know, the uh, flamethrowers are uh, outlawed. They don't, they're not allowed to be used. And I can see why. But, uh, uh, any more questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You look like a Marine. You still look like a Marine. You look great. Um, my, my question Thank is, uh, of course, it wasn't back in those days when they talked about uh, PTSD, but did you, was it a real struggle uh, uh, the Marines and, and mm -hmm. contemplating the things that you went through? Um, I'm going to sit down for a second. Go ahead. Was it, was it ever a struggle in terms of reliving the experiences that you um, had to go through in Iwo Jima later on in life? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't mind telling you that, uh, you know, I'm not the only one. We did shed some tears. And uh, when you have a buddy that, uh, well, let me tell you a quick story about Ray Rotker from Stillwater, Minnesota. And uh, he told me later on after we met, he told me later on what he was doing. And this happened in Camp Pendleton. I'll try to be quick about this, but it's, it's, it's a good story. And this happened in Camp Pendleton, and I was running between the barracks. I did a lot of running. And uh, he told me what he was doing. He knew just about when I was coming down through the barracks, and he was standing at the window waiting for me. And uh, he says, when I first got my first look at you, he says, I didn't like you for shit. You look like a smart ass. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, 
a little, little later on that day, the next day, I was running through there again, and he comes running up beside me. He says, can I run with you? And I said, sure. So we ran together. And I might write a book, possibly. It's possible that I might write a book saying, how do you meet a buddy? And that's how Ray and I met. And he says, how can, can I run with you? Later on, he says, can we pass the football around out in the middle of the field? And I said, sure. So we did that in Parade Field. The next, so the next day, we were at it again. And uh, he says to me, he says, uh, can we do some boxing? I was, I was on the boxing team there in the Marine Corps. And, uh, and I said, yeah, sure. And uh, so we went in and did some boxing. And I says, hold it, Ray, hold it. I said, he says, what's the matter? I said, there's a banana peeling on the floor. One of us is going to step on it and break our damn neck. And he starts laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? He says, well, I put the banana peeling on the floor hoping that you would step on it and I could hit you on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that was, that was my buddy. Now, I'm getting where I shed a tear, and that's uh, <coughs> when we were up around Modem Airfield uh, number two. And uh, we were on the front line there all night long. There were Japanese. I, I could see Japanese creeping in on us and whatever. And I was on a machine gun. And my buddy to my left, he was on a machine gun. And uh, we opened up a fire. But what I want to bring up here is that Ray was just a little ways from me, and he got shot through the neck. Well, I'll tell you what. I had all I could do to control myself. But I did shed a tear. And uh, he was buried there on Iwo Jima. And then when uh, we turned to Iwo Jima or to Japan, like we did there in France. We turned France back to France during the First World War because that's their country, that was their land. Iwo Jima was Jap Japanese land, and they needed the land. They, you know, they didn't have a lot of, lot of li land at all. So anyway, Iwo Jima was returned back to Japan. So Ray was buried there on, on Iwo Jima. Well, after the war was over with, Japan wanted uh, they wanted all the dead Marines to be buried, dug up, and sent back home. They did not want any dead Marines buried on Iwo Jima. So we did that. And uh, so then Ray went, some, some of the uh, dead went to Guam, and Ray went to Guam. He was buried there in Guam. And then he was dug up again and reburied at the punch bowl there in the Hawaiian Islands. So that's where he's at today. And he was shot in the neck, and I'm telling. So I, you know, um, I don't. I, I'm, I'm not ashamed of myself. You know, I, I did shed a tear, and uh, that, that's uh, that's what you will do for a buddy. And so, any more questions? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> there's an article in the paper yesterday. Yeah. Okay. About the um, <clears throat> they found that one of the flag raisers uh, that was credited was the fellow from Sh Shano, Wisconsin. Uh, they said that he was on the first flight, and there was another person named Harold Schultz uh -huh. from Detroit on the second flight. So they got them mixed up. Oh, yeah. All mm -hmm. this time, oh. we didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Did you know Schultz? I don't know. If I bumped shoulders with him, I didn't know. They were in the 28th Regiment. So. Yeah, he was 28th. Ira Hayes was 28th also. Mm -hmm. And I was 27th. So we went together up that mountain. We, we, we were a team. That's how we all got mixed in. We were all mixed in. So after you took the mountain, then you went down to take the airfield? Uh, I was uh, I was a volunteer to go up on on uh, Mount Sarabaji. My commander says they need help up there. I'd like to have some volunteers, and I says I'll go, sir. And uh, so I was calling up the top of the mountain, and uh, I spent the rest of the day and, and a, a good week there on Sarabaji, going down inside the caves, down there were caves inside that volcano down there. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm what I'm driving at is that. Uh, like I say, I was on Sarabachi for a good 
week and a half at least anyway. But uh, as far as my going back after uh, we took uh, the uh, mountain, then I went back down to my command. That's what I did. But that was after I uh, crawled through a cave. I crawled through the cave first, and then uh, then I went back down to my to my command. Then, then what was your next uh, uh, area that you were in? Was the airfield there at the southern end? Well, I was uh, right in here as well as that, and. Uh, and I was at the, right at the end of the airstrip there. That's where I was at. We spent a good week there, a week and a half or so. And you know, and like I say, we were supposed to take you with G1 in three days. Well, it never happened. And uh, so I spent a good, I'll put it this way, if not two weeks, a week and a half in this area. And we didn't even have, the, we didn't even touch the rest of the island yet. So Did you get up to the other end? Of the oh yeah, uh-huh. And I'm glad you brought that up because uh, what I want to say here is that we were, I went from here all the way up. I was on that whole campaign from the 19th of February to the 26th of March. Day and night fighting. No rest, no sleep. We were, I, I'll tell you, we were so tired. We were just, you know, we just, uh, but uh, we were scared too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I went to the whole island. And I was down right in here when uh, we heard that Iwo Jima was, had surrendered. And then so I went, went on back down and uh, getting ahead of myself here just a little bit here. But uh, when, we, Iwo, when we finally took Iwo Jima, while we went back on down here and uh, the troop ship was backed into the island, right in here. There was all the coral, and uh, but the troop ship was backed up to where we could get on. And uh, this is the 26th of March when we were doing. We so we marched five miles from here to here, <clears throat> and uh, I looked at that big flag that they had up there, and I th pictured a small flag. I thought, shoot, I could see that flag, and the rest of us agreed. You know, we didn't need a big flag up there. We could see a little flag. I could see it, but that, you know. So, uh, I gotta tell you what happened here. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, when the island was over with, and uh, we were climbing on back on board ship, and like I say, the ship was backed in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see all that driftwood there. <clears throat> that's, like I say, that's from the Pacific storms in there. And uh, are you in that picture? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm down on the very end. Yeah. With the helmet up in the air. Yeah. Right there. Oh, okay. Right there. And that's Ira Hayes right now. Ira Hayes is right there. Right yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> At, see, at first I was kind of in the back there at first, uh, waiting, because Joe, Ro <coughs> Joe Rosenthal was trying to get us jarheads lined up, and we didn't know how to do that, you know. <laughs> I remember him still yelling at us. <laughs> and uh, so what, what happened was that um, Ira Hayes yelled at me, get over here. And I said, I'm okay. I was in the back where I was at. He says, get up here. And he was a corporal and I was a PFC. So I came up there and uh, I started to kneel down. He said, no, no. He says, uh, I want you to stand up. I says, I told her, I said, well, you don't need to do that. You know, I'll, I'll kneel down. She says, no, I want you to stand up. So I, like I tell Karen, Ira and I were arguing up there on the top of that mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you meet uh, Ira Hayes? Were you in training with him? Or? Yeah. I'm going to park my butt here for a minute. Good. Good. Um, yeah, it happened in the Hawaiian Islands. And um, the meet the, we were at the Big Island, the uh, Hawaii. And uh, I saw uh, 
I didn't know who Ira was at the time, but I saw him working on his uh, uh, switchboard that he had hooked up on his Jeep. And uh, I, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go over there and, and uh, meet him. I wanted to uh, introduce myself, and which I did. I got over there and I told him who it was, and uh, I was from South Dakota, and because I knew he was from Arizona. I knew Ira Hayes before all this took place. And he never, he never has met me until up until that time. And uh, so we got acquainted and introduced each other. And I says, Ira, I says, uh, <clears throat> could you teach me how to speak this Navajo? And he says, oh yeah, sure, sit down. So after about an hour and a half, he looks at me and he says, did you say you're from South Dakota? I said, yes. He says, when can you go back? <laughs> he gave up on me. <laughs> I couldn't speak that stuff to save my life, you know. <laughs> but that's how we met. That's how we met. And Ira, I know Ira, I can talk about Ira, and um, <clears throat> I can defend him honestly. And uh, if I'm ever called in to talk about Ira, I'll do it. I don't care if it's D.C. or wherever. They want me to talk about Ira. I will do it. <clears throat> And uh, real quick here, when Ira came back from, uh, he found me there on the, on the, on the side of the mountain, we the 28th and the 27th, like I say, we were, we were together, and making him together and all this sort of thing. And we bumped into each other. And uh, I'm, this is after we, we met there in the Hawaiian Islands. And anyway, um, he was telling me that uh, they want me to go to D.C. And I said, what the hell for? It's to sell bonds. What do you think? That's exactly what he said to me, to sell bonds. What do you think? I realized that it was important to him. At the time, he wanted to know what I thought. I told him, Ira, I says, you better go for it. If you can end this damn war and all this killing, you better go and get the job done. He says, okay, and he went back down the mountain. And that's the last I saw of him for quite a while. So then when uh, we were up by that time, when he came back, he did not like D.C. He didn't want to be in D.C. Because he, because he knew that we were still on the front line. Ira was a brave man. And still is. And he was uh, beside me as we were going up that mountain, shoulder to shoulder. I know about Ira more than a lot of people do. And we were going up the side of that mountain together. And he, uh, here's how this got started. He says, well, we were uh, guarding the flag raisers. And I, I think I mentioned this already, I don't know. But anyway, uh, he mentioned, he says, uh, I think I'll go up and help them. It looks like they're having trouble trying to get that flag up. And the wind was blowing so strong up there. And I told him, I says, go for it, Ira, and I'll cover you. And that's the way. That, that's the way it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he have did he have his problems that they started after the war? Oh, do, do what now? His problems that Ira had, did, did they start uh, after the war? Or? Well, he, he admitted to me, I want to talk about that just a little bit. Uh, he admitted to me, we had our beer on the reservation. We all had our beer. And I'm from the Roseblood Reservation there in South Dakota. And I know those guys. I, I used to box with them. We, they, we were on the, they were on the Golden Gloves and so was I. I was on the Golden Gloves for about three years. So I got real familiar with the Roseblood Reservation. And they drank beer. They didn't, they didn't uh, try to hide it or anything like that. They, they wanted to have their beer. And so I was, that's, the, that's the, what we were doing. We, we had our beer. Well then, when he went to D.C., uh, he got to thinking about how we are still fighting, and he wasn't fighting. He was among the, the dignitaries, and talking and whatever they were doing, and he told me, he says, I did not like D.C., I wanted to get back with you guys. Because I, he says, I knew you were on the front line, and that's where I wanted to be. So he was sent back to Iwo Jima. He found me up around Motoyama Airfield number two. 
which is right up in here, up in this area. And um, he ran up to me and he grabbed, here's what he said. He grabbed me by the arm. He says, come on, let's take cover before one of us got killed. I got some stuff to tell you. <laughs> so <laughs> he was level, he leveled with me what happened to him there in D.C. He got the drinking, that hard stuff. He says, I couldn't stand it. I didn't like the taste of it in the first place, but I, I did drink it. Mm -hmm. and so that's how he got started drinking. There is another picture about Ira Hayes supposedly fighting on the streets. Well, that's a lot of BS. He, you know, he wasn't doing stuff like that. He was more of a man than that. And uh, so, so a lot of this stuff got uh, kind of uh, turned around with Ira Hayes. He was a brave Indian, American Indian. And I'll stick up for him. Any more questions? But yeah. Did you say the uh, B-29s were landing while you were attacking Sirvachi? Yes. So they, uh, huh? they didn't have any choice. They had to come no, in. No, they were coming in. Uh, I saw them. I just happened to look over my shoulder and I saw them coming. And uh, the one in front was just above the other two a little bit. And uh, the, two, two, the two behind, both of their engines were out. But the one in the front, his two engines were running on the left-hand side. And uh, those two planes finally crash-landed out there in the water. And I saw the crew running out and then down the wings and jumping into the water. And I thought, boy, I hope you guys can swim, because there were, there's still a ways out there. Okay, that other bomber hit the end of the airstrip, Motoyama Airfield number one. The nose hit that airstrip, bounced up, skidded across a bomb hole, and the nose picked it up again. It hit the other side of that bomb hole and bounced up and skidded some more into another bomb hole. And it came out of that the same way. But it stopped within maybe 50 yards from that bomb hole. And the crew jumped out of that B-29 and they just scattered. They were all over the place. And the bullets hitting that B-29 was just unbelievable. Just ratty tat 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 one right after another. And I didn't see anybody go down because they were dodging, doing stuff like this, you know, running out of there. So, so yeah, I saw the first three B-29s coming into Iwo Jima. Any more questions? Yeah. How many days was it all together from the time you landed the uh, well, I landed the island was cleaned up and Yeah, it was about a month and a half. I landed, uh, of course, on the 19th of February, and then the island wasn't over with till the 26th of March. And uh, like I say, we were supposed to take it in three days, you know. There's just no way we could take that island in three days. The Japanese had more artillery on that island and what we had out in the ocean. Oh, I got <laughs> I got to turn around and make sure she's not sneaking up on me. <laughs> I got to tell you something share what happened. Uh, I was talking and then it reminded me of something else. What it is was when the flag went up, you should have heard of the Navy firing their terror guns out there in the ocean. There was black smoke and red smoke and orange smoke all through the air. Boom, 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 boom. We were all celebrating the flag raising. I fired my rifle in the air and I, and I whooped like an Indian. I can do it too. <laughs> but that was the most beautiful thing to see that flag going up. And the Navy was behind it. They wanted to salute that American flag, and boy, they did. They had every terror gun to get their hands on to fire them. I wanted to, I wanted to tell you about that. And then real quick, uh, to also too, if I'm getting towards the end of my talk here, I'd like to talk about the flag again. It'd be just a short little talk. Meanwhile, I'll yeah, answer some more questions if I can. Where'd the second flag go? Yeah, uh, that stayed on Mount Suribachi, that second flag. Okay, it didn't come down. Um, that second flag was up there all the while we were on the front line. 
The first flag, of course, came down. Uh, it was up at 10, about 10.15 on the 23rd. And then that flag stayed there until around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's when they t took down that flag. So that it was up there about five hours. And so this is why we feel that that first flag saw a lot of Marines killed. There was an area there where there were Marine bodies everywhere. We couldn't take cover. There was no way for us to take cover. There were no caves for us to crawl into. There was nothing that we could take cover. They just nailed us right out in the open. And we had to fight out in the opening to take Iwo Jima. That's just about what it was. But the second flag was up for the duration of the battle, but then did, is it in the museum in Quantico now? Or? Yeah, it was, uh, no, that's the first flag. I don't know where that flag's at today. Uh, for the duration, uh, the second flag stayed up for the duration, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did and you get into the uh, headquarters, the Japanese headquarters on the island at all? As far as I know, uh, mm -hmm. there was nothing. Uh, the only headquarters that they had was underground. I mean, they, they had a village down there, you might as well say. And uh, like I say, there's uh, Japanese uh, that uh, are uh, down in those caves today. Yeah, and because uh, I know, because I, you know, like I say, I crawled into a cave, so I I know what's going on in those cave, and they're down there. Yeah, yeah. One question. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. Of course, it's much appreciated. I think everyone here is grateful oh, for you to give your talk and tell your story. Well, oh, thank you. What? Thank you. Uh, one question. What is written on your jacket? <laughs> Looks like Jack's wearing an M41 jacket, and there's something written on it. Do you know? No. <laughs> Where's that other picture? <coughs> well, it, it, that well, it's just that's a different jacket. Yeah, this picture here was taken by Joe Rosenthal after I came out of the cave. That's why. That's why I'm stripped down. I didn't have my cartridge belt with me or anything. Um, you know, I. I'll be honest about it. Uh, they were, at the, you're, you're talking about up here, right? Yeah, that's your name, right? Yeah, I was going to say JRT. I don't see that on the rest of the jackets. I never noticed that before. I just assumed it was his title. Yeah. But I wonder if, because when this photo was taken, he was the last identified Marine. So perhaps they just, it looks like they've got just lines going around it trying to identify the name. There's another one here too that I found here recently. This one came in. Hmm. Uh, not that one. And he is in this photo also up in the top right. This is a new one that we found. Do you mind if I stand up and oh, yeah. sure go ahead? I was trying to find a second flag and didn't find something. Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's one but right there, <laughs> that guy right there is also Jack, my dad. So this is another photo right there, and then Ira Hayes is sitting in front of him. Yep. So that that must have been taken like just like Either a minute or so before. Seconds before, before or after. seconds after. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. In that photo on the lower left-hand side, is that the new flag and the old flag? That's switching out number one and number two. Okay. So the one that's up is the <coughs> second one. You know, I, I, I wonder the same thing. I oh, don't know okay. what, the, what the process is, if they were still just bringing the second one up to replace one, or <coughs> the second one's up and they're taking the other one down. I'm not sure. Well, this might help you here if I mention something here. Uh, I, I noticed you're asking how long was this flag up and so on, so on, and so on. That flag, the first original flag, went up 
it was up for five hours. It went up on, or I mean five days. On the 19th until the 23rd, it went up on the 23rd. And then it was up for five hours before it was taken down at three o'clock. So it gives you an idea. That flag was, our original flag was only up for five hours. Any more questions? He likes go to. Yeah. Go ahead. He likes to wrap up too with this with the flag. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But I think this gentleman had. A yes. Question. Go ahead. I sorry. didn't. I didn't oh, see him. <laughs> what? My question is, what did it feel like when you were notified that the end of the war came? The atomic bomb was dropped. Oh, we were at the end of the island when that when we found out. We were, we were standing along here. I actually standed in the water right here. I did. I actually stood in the water. And we were raising our rifles in the air, cheering, you know, and that uh, the, the war is over with. Jack? What was your reaction now? What were you thinking when you heard that the bomb... Oh, you know, it's just... The things went, there's one thing that went through my mind. I wish my buddy could be here. When did you get off of the island? Um, I was on the island from uh, the, let me think here now. The battles were with on the uh, 26th. And so we marched all the way back, back to here, all the way to here that same day, which was the 26th of March. And uh, there's a little story I'd like to tell you here that, uh, like I say, there was coral in here underneath the water. So we had to wait out to the ship. I had water up here like this. And... Uh, we went up a steel ladder as we go up the side of the ladder. And uh, I was about the third in line. And I heard this sailor say, God, you guys stink. Really? <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> I hadn't had a bath for a month and a half, and I smelled like it too. <laughs> And another thing, we didn't want to have a toothbrush sticking in our mouth, laying flat on our back, getting killed. So we didn't brush our teeth either. <laughs> but yeah, so. Where did you go after you got off the island? Uh, we went. Uh, uh, as we went to, let me think here. Oh, 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 yeah, okay, boom, boy, when it comes, it comes. <laughs> what happened is this, that I saw something that'll, you know, just in some ways blow your mind. So we were above the Marshall Islands. There was a storm. We were supposed to go into Alaska. Okay, now when we were getting on board ship, there, was a, there were two Higgins boats parked alongside of our ship, lonely wounded on board. And those corpsmen were so careful and gentle, putting those guys on a stretcher and getting them up on board. I'll never, I'll never forget that sight. They were so good about taking care of wounded Marines. Okay, so we got above the Marshall Islands. We had our first Marine die of his wounds. And I was on the color guard, and the burial at sea took place above the Marshall Islands, about, oh, maybe one quarter of the way to uh, Alaska. And the way that worked, they have a, a burial slab, and then the body is under the American flag. And uh, as that uh, slab tilt forward, upward, the body slips out under that flag. First thing I saw was his feet. He was in a gray bag, 
His feet were tied together, his ankles were tied together. And then when his head came out, his neck was tied. And into the water he went. And I'll never forget the sound of that splash. And then the next body, I would say maybe about three quarters of the way to Alaska from Marshall Islands, we had another burial. See, our troop ship was not equipped to take care of dead bodies. And uh, the Navy tradition is a sea burial. The sea belongs to the Navy. And that's, that's where they were interned. And uh, Marines can be interned also because we are part of the Navy. And uh, so there were two burials between Marshall Islands and Alaska at sea. And like I say, I was on the color guard. And it's something I'll never forget. And uh, I have a lot of questions from people that uh, why can't they bring the body back up and, you know, take it back home? And my answer to that is we want to be buried together. That's what we want. We were trained together and we were killed together. And we played together. We're still together down in the bottom of the ocean. So we're still buddies. That's just the way it is. Uh, yeah. Jack, on one of the photos, I think it's like two back, there was there one of the flag racing or Oh, yeah. Group picture. I noticed that one of the uh, Marines was, there he is on the right, bottom right, like he's still oh, fired. Like he's, are you still taking fire there? No, I, I don't want to say too much. That was just posed. <laughs> it wasn't over after the flag went up. There was yeah. Still, yeah. No, I'm I, sorry. The war, it wasn't over when that flag went up. Right. It, yeah, there was still fire. Yeah. So he's one of the snipers, I assume. Yeah. I don't like that pose. <laughs> so. Do you like that pose better? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're getting down to some class. <laughs> you kind of stopped <coughs> them, um, about the burial at sea. Yeah. That the neck was tied, the feet were tied. What was it tied to and why? You kind of stopped there. What, what was that, Karen? Tell them why the neck was tied. Oh. Neck to what and why? Uh, more or less to really secure the burial flag. And uh, that was the... Uh, it, 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 there's two places they tie down. At the end, I found out. I asked about that on board ship. There, why did they do that? Why? In other words, they, you tie them at the ankle, just let it go at that. But this is no. The neck has to be secured. It's all amounts to being secured down there in the water. And there's weights. Oh yeah, and there's weights. You want to tell a story? <laughs> yeah, sure. And so there's weights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's weights between the legs, and sometimes uh, one Navy guy told me that uh, they use it. It's been said that they use an artillery shell once in a while when they run out of uh, weights. They'll use an artillery shell to hold that body down. If they don't have something to hold that body down, it'll float back up to the surface. So they have to have a weight between their legs to hold them down. Now, what I'd like to do, I'm, uh, I'm, I'll, ha I'll, uh, I'll tell a story here, and uh, if there's any more questions, I'll take care of that. So, when we were, uh, when we were pulling away from uh, uh, Iwo Jima, and uh, we were all at the stern of this battle, sh of the uh, troop ship, and uh, we were saying to one another, why is this ship moving so slow? And I, I said, I, I don't know. And I turned around and looked up at the captain's deck. Here the captain was standing up there in front of the window like this, looking down at us. He was admiring the way we were all gathered at the stern, getting our last look of Iwo Jima. And we could, see the, we could still see the cemetery. Okay, so when the ship just gradually sailed away, it, then the ocean gradually creeps up. And the thing that uh, I saw was, like I saw, was in the burial ground 
and the mountain was gradually going behind the ocean water. And the last thing I saw standing was the American flag above that water. That is a sight that just make you choke. It was so beautiful. It was waving like this. And I made a comment, and the rest of the guys heard it. I said, this don't go too far away, boys. I'm still here. I don't know where it came from, but it, it came out of me. <laughs> Have you ever been back to Mount Sarabachi? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a little unhappy with what took place there. Because uh, I do remember uh, after the war was over with, Japan flew over Iwo Jima and uh, sprayed uh, wild seeds over the whole island of Iwo Jima. And uh, the results is nothing sh but shrubs. This looks terrible. I'd rather see the lava rock like it was. But there was just wild uh, bushes everywhere. And uh, then um, Channel 9 was my guardian. And um, he followed me all over that island like a, like a, <laughs> like a little puppy dog. <laughs> I didn't get very far from him. But he was a good guy. Anyway, um, what took place was uh, he, um, how do I put this? Um, yeah, it slipped my mind. Huh? He was asking when you went back to Iwo Jima, so he would start talking about two years ago when you went back. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is when we were on our, on our flight. Uh, and Channel 9 was a guardian. Okay, what happened was that um, the, uh, uh, the Channel 9, uh, hopefully, I don't know if they're going to cover me again or not. I don't know uh, on this up and coming stuff uh, on this flag today. And I'll be glad to talk about it if they want me to. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, getting back to the uh, uh, honor flight and the wild seeds that were scattered over that island. The thing that really broke me, though, I, if you don't mind my saying it, it isn't just just didn't didn't settle with me at all. Where the flag was originally, it starts. The, uh, so there's a concrete wall that starts where that flag was raised, and the concrete wall is about this wide and about this high. I would say it's 12 to 14 feet long. Guess where the American flag is? It's supposed to be up here. It was cleared down to the other end of this wall, and there are all kinds of flags. I don't know where anything about the flag, but there's four or five, six flags, and then the Japanese flag, where the American flag was. So I'm a little upset over that. And then evil didn't, didn't, evil didn't look good to me at all. No. The first time these guys tried to go out, um, Pardon? So they actually got stuck in Guam for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Didn't make it out the first time. And then the following year, they made another attempt, and they did make it to Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. And they had some really good coverage on Channel 9. Yeah. It was the eight stepping steps or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. That. Yeah, Channel 9 did a good job. A lot of people ask you the question, and I thought this myself, too, wondering when you were out there. Oh. What did you think, or how did you feel when you landed back out there again 65 years later? <laughs> she expects me to remember, huh? <laughs> well, you've been doing such a good job so far. <laughs> so this is when the... Uh, the uh, you Jima? Yeah. And you, got, you landed out there and you stepped down? Uh-huh. What were you feeling and thinking? Well, uh, when, I, when I made the beach landing? No, when you went back... Oh, oh, oh. Uh, we, we landed on Modi Airfield number one is where we landed. 
And, oh, that's a good question. It really is. Uh, when I came out of that plane and I was coming and I stepped onto the, onto the airstrip, I looked around, my God, I can't believe it. That's what was really caused my mind. All of my buddies that were killed before they got back up, before they got on Iwo Jima, they were killed out there in the water on 3M tracks. There's, there's, they're all the way from 20 to 30 guys per M track. So it gives you an idea how many guys were killed out there in the water. And I put it, I do, I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and say something else here too. That I put it this way, that uh, the actual killing started out there in the water, not on the island. And all those Marines went down. Not one Marine came up. Three M tracks that went down. And, I was, and then I was supposed to be the next one. The shell landed right here. Yep. Any more questions? Yeah. What, what did you What did you do after the war? I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what I did. Uh, as long as I got a little time here, I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, after the war was over with, we were on our way to Japan. We were going to make a landing on Japan in the Kyushu area, right below Tokyo. And uh, so we were all geared up and ready to go. Uh, the, the second bomb, you had the Nagasaki and then Hiroshima. The second bomb that was dropped, we didn't hear it but it dropped behind us in the channel. We were already in the channel, ready to make our landing on, on Japan. We were supposed to be the first white troops to ever put foot on Japanese soil. So when they surrendered, then we went on down into Saga area. And we, that's where the submarines and so on, and there's the biggest ammunition dump in that area there in Saga. So we took over that area. Well, what happened? They put me in the military police. I was in the military police for about eight months there in Japan. And so I'm, I'm what I'm driving, I'm driving at something here. And so um, I learned a lot about Japanese. I was out in the middle of this intersection there in Saga uh, directing traffic. And I had the white gloves on, Billy Cub, white hat, white leggings. I was all decked out. And the reason I'm bringing that up is there was a lady standing on the corner. And I found out a little bit later, she wanted to talk to me. And she knew I was a policeman. So she felt safe with me. I figured that out a little bit later. Her question was, she says, how come the United States attacked Japan? And I, then I explained to her what happened. She says, where is Pearl Harbor. She says, I know where Hallelujah is, but where's Pearl Harbor? See, that was pretty much hushed up all through the years until the bomb, or until the, yeah, until the Japanese attacked it. So she had no idea where Pearl Harbor was at. But she knew where Hallelujah was. But she was, wait she was waiting there to talk to me on the curb. So uh, the time that I put in there in Japan on military police, I had a jeep assigned to me and all this, and uh, I'd be called out on calls soon when there's, when there's this disturbance, this disturbance in the, in the, in the uh, neighborhood and took care of all the, any problems that we have. So what I'm driving at is I had about eight months of police duty, eight to nine months police duty. And uh, so when we came back to the United States, I thought, by God, I'm going down to L.A. and see if I can get myself a job. So. I was standing in the front of the desk there, and I finally got up to the desk, and this uh, sergeant says, how tall are you? I says, i five foot nine. Next. I was too short. <laughs> so, so that kind of irritated me there in L.A. So then what I did, I got out on 101, Highway 101, and I hitchhiked to uh, Washington State. I wanted to get away from the coast area, because there were servicemen everywhere. When we were coming off board ship there in San Diego, you, 
and uh, the sailors and the Marines going down Broadway. The wave of hats was going like this down the sidewalks. Just all I could see is white hats. <laughs> I'll never forget that. So what happened was uh, I got into Spokane, and uh, I was sitting at a bus stop there, looking at the uh, one ads, and uh, I found an article. Article in this uh, chicken ranch needed need, and uh, I thought, well, shoot, I know all about chickens because I was raised on a farm. <laughs> so I hitchhiked out to this ranch. I think it was seven miles out, I think, from Spokane. Pound on the door. Guess who answered the door? A Japanese. <laughs> I'm still looking for a job. <laughs> but that family took me in. Well, I was there for, I think, a good three months. They did everything for me, and I really, that family was really nice to me. It was a Japanese family, and I ate like a king. So I stayed there for a while. Well, maybe about, I think it was only about a month and a half to two months. And then I hitchhiked to, uh, I decided to hitchhike back to South Dakota. And so I got work there in South Dakota uh, for Ford Motor Company. Worked for Ford Motor Company for a while. So that's what I did when I got discharged. <laughs> you went home, and who came to visit you when you went home? Oh, I love her, you know. <laughs> oh, this was special. And I didn't know anything about it until I got home. My mom's Irish, and she got a bad temper. I don't know why. She had 15 kids, so I don't know why she had such a temper. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Mom and Dad were like, uh, I'll, I'll answer your question here in a minute, Karen. But Mom and Dad were a lot like Mom and Paul Cattle. And Dad always going around, hmm, I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, I, one day I was uptown, and I got back to the farm, and uh, Mom turns to Mom turns to me. And she says, uh, "There was some damn Indian looking for you." I said, "Oh, Mom, that was my buddy." Eh, and walked out of the kitchen. <laughs> that was, that's all there was to it. There was some damn Indian looking for you. <laughs> Ira Hayes, yeah, that was Ira Hayes. Ira Hayes hitchhiked all the way from Arizona up to South Dakota. He didn't have a car. Didn't have money to buy a car or anything. But he hitchhiked up to South Dakota to see me. So I tells you what kind of a buddy he was. And uh, the, all the drinking that uh, he did there in D.C., he was trying to be a buddy. He was trying to be a good guy. He was trying to be, you know, one of the guys and all that. But he said, he told me that, the, he says, really, I didn't like the taste of that damn stuff. He says, I like, I like my, bitter, my beer better. <laughs> But he, uh, he couldn't handle whiskey. He says, I don't know how you people drink that stuff. I remember him talking about it. <laughs> but he drank just to be one of the group. And he got into trouble. And that's what happened. Yeah. Oh, so one more thing here. Uh, on, my, on my honor flights, uh, I've been to DC twice. Um, Arlington Cemetery once, and uh, so when we pulled up there to Arlington Cemetery, um, the driver of this van uh, came over to me and he says, uh, aren't you Sergeant Thurman? I said, yes, I am. He says, you're a, uh, a buddy of our Hayes, aren't you? And I said, yes. He says, would you like to see his grave? I says, I sure would. He says, okay, get in. There are four of the Marines standing there. And then he says, hey, can we go along? The driver said, yeah, sure, jump on. So we drove not too far to Ira Hayes' grave. And what did, oh, I wish I would have bought a picture of him. I have it in the new PowerPoint I made last night, but it didn't save. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's all right. There's a green path about, I would say, maybe 10 feet wide that comes down the road and goes up a little incline. 
to his headstone. And his headstone is right in the middle. And I went around on the other side, put my hand on his headstone, and went, you know, and uh, the other Marines were standing around the grave. One of them says, uh, I said, uh, would you guys, now I'm not, I'm not a religious man, but I do believe in prayer. And that's what I said to him. I says, uh, I asked, I says, do you guys mind if I say a prayer? I says, I'm not a religious guy, but I, I do believe in prayer. And that's what I said to him. And he says, we'll say it with you. So those four guys I don't know today knelt down on Ira Hayes' grave and we all said the Our Father together. Thank you, Jack. And what I'd like to do on behalf of the museum, uh, present Jack with a challenge coin from the museum. And oh, also okay. to Karen. And thank you, Karen, for a wonderful, wonderful PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Bob? No, just before we break up, a couple of things. Uh, today is the anniversary of the start of the Korean War. Right. And we have several Korean veterans here. Yes, we do. Your hands. 